be here on this occasion. Connect, con congratulations everybody. I'd love to be here and have this chance to talk about tilings, which is such an old topic going back thousands of years, and yet somehow it keeps producing interesting new results, some of them by undergraduates, as I'll mention, some of them by amateurs, as I'll mention. Now these tilings, here I have a couple here, but I want to look for optimal or efficient tilings. That is, tilings where you minimize the amount of fencing that it takes to enclose these areas, which I'll assume are all unit areas. So the tiles all have area one, each tile has a certain perimeter, and our goal is to minimize the perimeter of the amount of fencing. Now the answer to this first question is actually known for a while, not too long though. What is the most efficient way to tile the plane? So I don't know, maybe you have some ideas about what the most efficient way to tile the plane might be. It could be there's some, I have various, these are actually pretty simple examples here because in these examples every tile is the same space, it's the same shape. But you could also allow tilings where the tiles have different shapes. Yes? I have three guesses. Three guesses, <laughs> All right. Okay, number one. My first guess is the honeycomb pattern, a bunch of regular hexagons. Regular hexagons, that's your first guess. And your second guess? My second and third guesses are those two on the upper left corner. Right triangles, triangles, squares, triangles. and hexagons. And, and you note that the triangles one, if you get rid of, uh, it, you, if you get rid of a bunch of lines, you can actually get the honeycomb pattern. So that honeycomb pattern, and there it is, and that is the winner. What is your name? Joshua Bernard. Joshua is the winner here. Yeah, hexagons are the best you can possibly do. No matter, even if you allow infinitely many different shapes, and they're weird shapes, you can't beat using regular hexagons. This was proved in 2000, a pretty new result, by Thomas Hales. That's the same guy who proved the sphere packing conjecture due to Kepler. That was actually harder to prove. And when he proved this, it was the longest standing open problem in mathematics. It had been mentioned by the ancient Greeks. And there are documents, at least going back to ancient Rome, that mention this. The one longest extant was written by the soldier, the Roman soldier, Marcus Terentius Varro. On his deathbed, he was writing an epistle to his young wife with instructions on how she should take care of their farm estate. And on the estate, they had honeybees. And so he wrote at length about these honeybees. And he said, you notice they have these wonderful honeycombs composed of hexagons, these regular hexagons. And he said, there are two reasons, he explained to his wife, why bees use hexagons. He said, first of all, and you may smile at this reason, it's because they have six feet. <laughs> and so they're pushing out, they have six feet. There's one reason. Actually, it's not that absurd. Maybe that's why they evolved to have six feet. I don't know. And then the second reason, and here's the exact quote in translation, the geometricians prove that this hexagon inscribed in a circular figure encloses the greatest amount of space. So it's the most efficient way to enclose a given amount of area. Of course, the Greeks hadn't actually proved that. They, they just checked that it was better than any other competitor that they compared it with like the triangles and the squares that you talked about. So it wasn't an actual proof. And there were some other mistakes that Varro made in his, in his essay. He, he loved the bees, you know. He said, these are marvelous creatures, he said. They follow their king wherever he goes. <laughs> but you know, it wasn't known until the 17th century that it was actually a queen bee and not a king bee that was being followed. So, 2001, Hales proves this result, very interesting result, result with lots of applications, gets people thinking, got me thinking. I said, okay, this is proved. I want hexagonal tiles in my kitchen. And this led to the story of the, con oh, yes, what? I was going to say a word about this proof first, I guess. I wanted to say a word about this proof. We'll get back to my kitchen in a minute. <laughs> so I want to say a word about this proof. Now, you know, it's very hard to prove anything in the plane because it's infinite. So really, Hale started out by just looking at a very big square and then making it even simpler by identifying the left side and the right side and identifying the top and the bottom. This just makes a simpler thing to look at. Maybe you know, we know as mathematicians that if you actually take this and 
spend it around so that the left and the right side are identified and the top and the bottom are identified, you get a torus. So mathematicians would call this a torus. So Hales said he started out looking at the torus, an easier place to work. And in his proof, he had two lemmas. One was an easy lemma and one was a hard lemma. So to give you an idea of the proof, this was the easy lemma. And the easy lemma said that the average number of edges of a tile has to be at most six. So we saw you could have triangles, that's fine. You could have squares, that's fine. Actually, you can't fit octagons together very well and fill the plane with them. So, so this was a basic lemma. And the proof uses this wonderful formula of Euler, which says that on the torus, you always get zero if you take the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. Great formula of Euler. Well, now, if you add this up one tile at a time, and each tile, a tile has n edges, so it also has n vertices, so you should add up n. But careful, each vertex is in counted at least three times, because it's in at least three tiles. So maybe this should be n over 4, n over 5, but it's at most n over 3. So there's an estimate. And now the number of edges, well, each tile has n edges, but they count twice in the two adjacent tiles. So that's exactly an n over 2 that we subtract. And then, of course, each tile has one face. You add a 1 on. And if you remember that a third minus a half is minus a sixth, which our students eventually get, but takes a <laughs> of 1 minus n over 6. And if that's greater than or equal to 0, that means that n is at most 6 on average. So there's the easy lemma. That was the easy lemma. Now I'm going to show you the hard lemma. So the hard lemma is very useful. This is the kind of estimate that you want, the so-called hexagonal isoparametric inequality. What you'd like to know is that the average perimeter, say all areas 1, divided by the perimeter of the regular hexagon is greater than or equal to 1. That's what you'd like to prove. But of course, that's not quite true, because better than hexagons are circles, which cheat by bulging out. And better than hexagons are octagons, which cheat by having eight sides. So Hales' brilliant idea was to in include a penalty if you have lots of bulging or if you have more than six edges. So that's what he did on here. You see, he gets this to be true, not always greater than or equal to one, but you subtract off, here's this penalty, some constant times the total amount of bulging, x. There's the total area that you bulge out. And there's another penalty here for the amount that n is greater than six. And now you get something that's always true. Not so easy to prove, but always true. Kind of an ingenious statement about a sense in which each hexagon is best. Even though we know that for our problem, a circle would be better. But for his penalized problem, each hexagon is best. And then, once you have these two lemmas, it's not hard to do the proof. Look how it works. You just take that little formula that's true for each tile, and then average over all the tiles. Well, so you get the average P over P6 rather than equal to 1. The average amount of bulging is 0. Because if one tile bulges out, the adjacent tile bulges in. The total amount of bulging cancels. And what about that N minus 6? Well, we know on average N is less than or equal to 6, so that term is favorable. And so you get P over P6 greater than or equal to 1 on the average. Isn't that cool? Mm -hmm. So that's Hale's argument, and this is really the idea of semi proof sphere packing. By changing the global thing, which was you had to look at infinitely many tiles, to something you could prove about one tile, but something different that had some penalties with it. And then prove the global result. So that was his approach. This was the proof, so there's the proof of the theorem. This is now a theorem. And this is when I decide I wanted the tiles in my kitchen, and that leads to the story of the contractor in the hexagonal tiles, which is on my personal blog. <laughs> so the contractor finally agreed to do this after much resistance, <laughs> telling me you couldn't get hexagonal tiles. And then in the middle of the job, he ran out of the grout, which you know goes around the perimeter of the tiles to hold them together. And as a contractor, he had to give an excuse. And the excuse he gave to me at this time, was, it was because we were using hexagons with all that extra perimeter. 
Well, that was the wrong time, the wrong place, and the wrong person for that excuse. So I said to him, well, actually, in the little math lesson. Right. There are other problems with hexagonal tilings. There was one pointed out by Gary Larson, for example. He pointed out that it's very hard to use a map to find your way around the hexagonal tiling because it's so symmetric, you know. You're never sure exactly where you are from the map. Gary Larson. Took a while to get permission. So this, this is the theorem. These are best. These hexagons are, are the best no matter what you allow. The average, the average perimeter there per hexagon, since it's, it's shared, is about 3.81 for enclosing the unit area, about 3.81 per unit area. And that's better, for example, the triangles, which was your third choice which is about 4.56. Although the best triangles are, as you'd expect, the regular equilateral triangles. Just those, of course, the best hexagons are the regular hexagon. And similarly, the best quadrilaterals are the squares, which do a little better than the triangles, 4.00, but worse than the hexagons, 3.81. And that leads to the newer question that I want to talk about today. What is the best tiling by pentagons? Now, of course, you think, well, same answer. Just use regular pentagons. But unfortunately, they don't fit together. The angles aren't right. You try to fit the plane, you can't use regular pentagons. So maybe you think, well, I can't use can't use regular pentagons, so maybe you think, well, I can't use pentagons at all. But you can. There are lots of ways of tiling, even with a single pentagon. Here are some of them. And so the question that I had some of my students looking at was, what is the best way of tiling with pentagons? And here is what, here is what, so one of these, I should say about these, these are the 14 known types of tilings by a single pentagon. There may be more. Nobody's been able to decide for sure. This is an open question. Maybe you want to look for more. Because there were only about 10 known when Marjorie Rice, an amateur mathematician, profession, homemaker, a noble profession like mathematics, as a hobby, got thinking about this when she saw a column on tiling in her son's copy of Scientific American. And she got working on this and she found two of the new ones, including number 13 here. As I say, it's still not known if this is the complete list. Even the complete list of regular pentagons, uh, not regular, regular, there's none, but equilateral pentagons, where all the edges have, have length one, there are several of those and they were classified just in 1985, if you assume they're convex, by Hirschman and Hunt. And I guess just got an email message from them last week, and they said, we can even deal with the case now where they aren't convex, but we haven't been able to get that published yet. So you can watch for that. There's some news coming out. This beautiful one by Marjorie Rice was used as the tiling on the floor in headquarters at the Math Association of America in Washington. So you can go there and see that, that beautiful tiling they used. Yeah, I don't dare use that with my contractor. I don't think he can handle that one. <laughs> I don't think he can handle that one. That one's a little too complicated. So hexagons and pentagons and all polygons, but our pentagons in particular, occur all over the world throughout history. This is a wonderful structure, memorial structure in Iran built in 1197 called the Blue Tomb. You can see there are some there are some pentagons here in this design. It's actually a beautiful color design, not in this picture, but here's an article from Nature that shows the blue ribbons dividing. You can see some of the pentagons there. Beautiful things. And so when I started talking about these, I started seeing more and more examples. Here, this is from New Delhi, New Delhi actually, at the shrine in honor of the mystic Hazrat Inyat Khan. And there are a lot of pentagons in there along with some triangles. When I started talking about these, all of my colleagues started saying, oh yes, pentagons are everywhere. The geologist in my, in, in the hall, down the hall brought me some fool's gold or pyrite that has pentagonal faces on it. And then the, 
the biologist said, oh, and how about our vegetables? Okra, you know, that's a pentagon. Or the flowers, the morning glory is a pentagon. And then the astronomers said, and there's some, there are some heavenly, what are they called in the sky? Constellations. 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 <laughs> yes, there's some constellations. This is Aru Aruga, the charioteer, is a pentagon. That's in the upper horn of Taurus. So, so there are a lot of these, there are a lot of pentagons throughout the world, a lot of pentagonal tilings. Which one is the most efficient? And I worked on this, there were actually eight students working with me on this. And this is the new theorem that I want to tell you about. This is in the current issue of the Notices of the American Mass Society, just out this week, I think. So you can find it there. Uh, eight students, and these are, the, these are our winners. These are our winners. There's the so-called Cairo and the prismatic, and they both have the property that they have two 90-degree angles and three 120-degree angles. Here. Over here, the 90-degree angles are not adjacent. They're here and here. And then there's still the three 120-degree angles. <coughs> this Cairo pentagonal tiling, I find on the web you can buy these tiles and do your driveway with them, maybe. Be nice. Why Cairo? Well, supposedly, they're all over the place in Cairo. So I have this friend who said to me, I can't find them anywhere. There's no documentation of pentagonal tilings in Cairo. And then just a couple years ago, he met this photographer, Helen Donnelly. My friend David Bailey met this photographer, Helen Donnelly, who had actually gone around Cairo and found these. They're all over the place. You can find them on the sidewalks and in the streets. Look at, look at, see, it's just an ordinary sidewalk, an old garden hose, and there's rubbish in the gutter there, and they have these marvelous mathematical Cairo tilings in Cairo. And then the other one, the prismatic pentagonal tilings, which some of the experts call by the more technical term the house tile. My, another one of my colleagues pointed out is a familiar corn crib shape. This was, he sent me this thing from the Field Guide to New England Barns and Farm Buildings. So I got here intrigued and then I just walked around town and I found someone, someone like that myself. There was a house in Williamstown last month that I found that has that wonderful wonderful prismatic pentagonal tiling shape. So there they are. Now that doesn't completely describe the shape. It doesn't tell you how tall to make the house. You could keep the angles the same, make the house a different shape. The best thing to do is, in, is to circumscribe it about a circle. Circumscribe it about a circle. That's true for both of them. And we, so we needed this lemma. And for, I thought this maybe was a new fact. I couldn't find it anywhere. Do you know this fact? Did you know this fact that if you're given the angles of a polygon, then the way to minimize perimeter for a given area is to circumscribe it around a circle. There's a famous fact that if you're given the lengths of the sides, it's best to inscribe it in a circle. That's how you get the most area. But this, I couldn't find anywhere. But you know, one of the great things about the web right now is as soon as you put up something like this on the web, if it's known, someone will tell you. And so I got it. There was a quick comment that appeared on the web. And it now turns out that this is a, an example of Lindelof's theorem from 1869. So, interesting fact that was known, although apparently not widely known, because I talked to lots of my friends that didn't know about it. So there was that theorem. And again, I should give you an idea of the proof, but not too heavy on that, right? Not too heavy today. So again, you use Euler's formula. You can get some things from Euler's formula. And here what Euler's formula tells you is that on average, at least three of the angles have to be of degree three. So see, here's an angle of degree three. Here's one of degree four. But on average, at least three of them have to be of degree three, and therefore they have to be at least 120 degrees. So there have to be lots of big angles. That's sort of the hint there, lots of big angles. And then the second part of the proof is saying, is using convexity arguments to say that to have those particular values, it's best to have exactly 3 of 120 and 2 of 90. And the idea is, you know, with convexity, you sort of want to hit the average values exactly. You know, when you have a convex function, a concave up function, then the extreme values are on a line that's much higher than the middle value. So it's better to settle down into the middle and average values. So that's kind of the principle. That's really, that's really the idea of the proof. 
A big complication was the fact that once you say you're going to use pentagons, they can degenerate into quadrilaterals and triangles, and so you've got to worry about that. And that turns out to be a big complication, because now you have to worry about pentagons and quadrilaterals and triangles separately. And knowing that the average is 3, you still could have an average of 3.1 for the pentagons and 2.9 for the quadrilaterals. And what does it mean to say it's better to replace all the pentagons with the average if the average has 3.1 big angles? Well, I don't care. I allowed it. So that's what we did in the theorem. We, we generalized the problem, mathematicians often do this, from physical triangles that have to have integer number of angles of a certain type to imaginary pentagons that can have any fractional angles of a different type, right? Because the formula for area, if you look at it, involves the number of edges maybe, and, but you can pretend that's a real number. Yeah? So that was sort of the strategy that we used to allow such abstract polygons. Or instead of saying that they can tile, just say Euler's formula still has to be true. So now there's sort of these imaginary pentagons, and the whole proof works in this category of imaginary pentagons. So that was a big idea in the proof. Another thing was then you still, even, though, even if you've gotten the, the ideal pentagon and the ideal quadrilateral and the ideal triangle, you have to worry about how they're mixed together, and that takes certain numerical estimates. Of course, the nice thing is if you make a linear estimate about a point on a convex curve, then not only is it a good approximation nearby, but it tells you that the convex curve is always worse, always on one side. So that's another handy ingredient in the proof. So a lot of these things that come up, you know, in calculus, this idea of convexity and second derivative and linear approximation, turn out to be really valuable when you're trying to prove these sorts of results. This is the paper that appeared in Notices of the American Math Society. There you see the eight student authors there. Very international group, I should say. I'll say more about that later. A lot of pretty pictures. They're up in the right-hand corner, you see that little lemma that I told you about, that business that for given angles, the most efficient polygon is the one that's circumscribed about the circle. That's the best you can do. And then there were some of these numerical estimates here. It's hard to read that and make it bigger. Let's see it bigger, bigger. Yeah, look at that. Who would think you'd do that in a theoretical paper? Four decimal places. That's what we needed for estimating certain things. You see this P3, P4, P5. These are perimeters of triangles, quadrilaterals, and pentagons. And Q and K have to do with the number of sides and the size of the angles. And we pretend that those can be real numbers as well as having to be integers sometimes. And so these numerical estimates came in. And so that was the paper. And you see it's not a very long paper. And that was the... Yeah, here's the list. But, and that was the, that was the proof that these chiral and prismatic tilings are best. I don't know prismatic tilings are best. So, so that's sort of the news story. And now comes, now, we're get, now we'll get to the more fun part for you, thinking about things that we don't know the answers to. Maybe you can help a little bit. So one thing had to be, well, you'll see. So one thing was a question about whether you could get, I knew these were both winners, whether you could get a winner that used a mixture of chiros and prismatic. And I thought no, and I decided to have my group of students prove that. You can't do any better. And then this Brian Chung, this guy at MIT, a student at MIT, found uncountably many mixtures. Uncountably many mixtures of chiral and prismatic tiles. These are two of them right here. You might wonder, how could he ever think of uncountably many? And here was his idea. He noticed that you could take the chiro tiles and arrange them in a diagonal. And then you could take the prismatic tiles and arrange them in a diagonal. And the diagonals would fit together. So for example, in this right here, he has, see here is one chiro diagonal followed by a prismatic diagonal. Cairo, prismatic, one. But over here he has one Cairo followed by three prismatic, followed by one Cairo followed by three prismatic. So you can have any sequence of natural numbers according to how many of each you have, how many diagonals of each type at each step, and that's uncountably many different 
tilings, mixtures like this. Hold yeah, on. question. I thought the integers were countable, though. The integers are countable, but the number of sequences of integers is uncountable. Oh, that's right. So that's how that goes. So then their new project was, oh, well, here they, here, here they are. We, uh, this was such a great thing that I recruited Brian Chung for my undergraduate research group. So there he is. And there are the others. This is uh, here. Yeah, this is a very international group. Brian is from Hong Kong, international student. Lewis is from Venezuela, although he's living in the U.S. now, and he has an application for permanent residence pending. Miguel is from Mexico, although he already has attained his permanent residence status. And Narali Stanley is from India, although she was born here, so she's an American citizen. So they were working on, they thought, this is what Brian said they could do, that they could prove that these that he found, these collections, these diagonals of the Chiron prismatic are the only ways to mix them together. And they were writing up the proof. And I was giving a talk about this. And the night before I gave the talk, they found another one. <laughs> Very beautiful, actually. Look, it's sort of these overlapping hexagons. And then they found another one. It's a little less regular and beautiful, starting to get you worried. And then they went to the page of this amateur mathematician whom I mentioned, Marjorie Rice, and we're looking at some of her stuff, and they found that she actually had one there, kind of by accident. Because she wasn't looking for perimeter minimizing tiles. But she had this mixture of Chiron prismatic just because they fit together so well. And so she had an example that actually predated any of theirs, a way of mixing these Chiron prismatic together. And then they found this one. These are sardines. See, they look like sardines packed in a, <laughs> in a sardine can. Yeah, do you like these? Stripes. Spaceship. I like this one a lot. This one's beautiful, isn't it? Look at all the symmetry. So it is doubly periodic, right? You can see you can, you can, there's a symmetry of translation to the right, and there's a symmetry of translation up, but there are many more. There's some rotational symmetries. In fact, you can map any of these spaceships to any of the other spaceships. So this is one of the beautiful so-called wallpaper groups, and they actually found... So, it looks very similar to M.C. Escher's past life. I think he uses many of the wallpaper groups, and I think you're right. I think this is I think this is the one that occurs in that path of life one. So they were able to find counterexamples with four of the seventeen wallpaper groups and six other symmetry groups. I think ten altogether. Here's another one, Christmas tree. Has less symmetries. I think just just the uh, just the horizontal and vertical and 180 degree rotations and reflections. Christmas tree. There's another one, windmill. Kind of nice, it has that three-fold dihedral group symmetry. Chaos, <laughs> no symmetry at all. That's harder to find something like that, but they still have to describe how it goes on forever. Plaza. By the way, I proposed to Williams that with our new construction, they use this for the plaza. They said, we'll put it on our docket. <laughs> Water wheel, another one with threefold symmetry. And their favorite one, <laughs> bunny. Bunny. You can see it, sort of see the rabbit ears there, yeah? Yeah, yeah bunny. This is their favorite one. So this is one, Nirali, and I asked her if there was anything that she wanted to say to you about this, about this work, and this is what she had to say. Oh, and, and, and in a minute I'll tell you what she had to say. Wait a minute, Nirali. This is a little noisy. There we go. We tried to characterize all tilings by Cairo and prismatic pentagons, but we just kept finding more and more, and with ten different symmetry groups. Will we ever find them all? Oh, they worked on this. They were so great about this, yeah. <laughs> now, there's one thing about our theorem that I've suppressed 
so far? This is a big open question. And the question is about whether you could do better by mixing in non-convex tiles. The theorem assumes that all the pentagons are convex. Now, non-convex seems really ridiculous, right? Non-convex tiles have way wasted perimeter, way too much perimeter for the amount of area. But the fear is that maybe if you had just a few non-convex tiles, then you could have a lot of maybe regular pentagons and make up for it. So this is a very difficult question. We, I thought it would be easy, but it seems difficult. We don't know how to rule out those non-convex pentagons. And I think Brian had something to say about that. The mysterious question about whether we can mix in non-convex pentagons to be chiroprismatic tilings remains open on the plane, but we settled it for some small flat toric. So Mary mentioned that I have this, I'm a new bloggist at the Huntington Post, and so I decided to write my first blog about this. And I called it, Can Math Survive Without the Bees? Because, you know, I figure they have very short attention span, and it has to be linked to current news somehow. And I saw this article about bees dying out. So I thought, I'd say, well, then maybe math would die out, because look how important bees have been in the history of math, because the oldest long-standing open problem, the hexagonal honeycomb, just solved piling, blah, blah, blah. So I thought I could use that to get me going. So I, so I tried that. So can math survive without the bees? That was the, that was the topic. See, I started out here. The recent, is this a good lead in? The recent reports on the disappearance of bee populations have omitted mention of their role in the longest standing open problem in mathematics. You're luring the people in, you hope. You never know if this is going to work. And then, and then, I, had, then I told them about lots of the things, including uh, these tilings, including this little video of Nirali Shah. They got to see that too. But I hope you go there and write some better comments than they did. They're kind of silly at the Huffington Post, but you'll see there if you go to visit. Well, I'd like at this point to take a little intermission if you have any questions now, and then we'll take a five-minute break, and we'll come back for the more of a workshop part, which will be the second part, but I'm going to take a, uh, an intermission now. So any maybe questions? there are some questions. Or suggestions. How to eliminate non-convex tiles. <laughs> yes. So they good. know the most efficient way to pack spheres in space now? The most efficient way to pack spheres in space. Yeah, this was the Kepler conjecture that was solved by Thomas Hales. And it's the way that you'd expect. You know, you start with a layer of spheres that are in the hex hexagonal piling. Then you take another just like it, only you put the, them down in the holes from the previous one. Just keep going. But it's very hard to prove that something like that is best. And Hales' proof, which was about in the year 2000, used an argument just like the one I showed you here, which was he came up you see, the, the difficulty is that that is not the best way to pack spheres around a single sphere. There you should use the dodecahedral arrangement. But it is the best way to pack them in all of space. So he had to change the local problem, adding penalties, so that he could prove that and deduce the global problem. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. all that. Oh, yes, good. Um, I noticed that um, the tiling of the hexagons was rendered on a torus. Yes. I'm wondering, would you be able to, would you be able to completely tile the sphere uh, using the honeycomb pattern? So if you're going to tile the sphere with hexagons, you can do this very well, only you also need to go with them 12 pentagons. So like a soccer ball, you're saying? A soccer ball is a good example. That has 12 pentagons and, and, and 24 hexagons. Yes. You can have, but it turns out you can, tile this, you can uh, tile the sphere with any number of hexagons and 12 pentagons, except you can't have one hexagon. You have two hexagons and 12 pentagons, you can have just 12 pentagons and no hexagons. Anything except one hexagon and 12 pentagons. 
And the reason you need those 12 is because the Euler characteristic of the sphere is different, right? Instead of E, uh, instead of V minus E plus F being 0, on the sphere it has to be 2. So how long do they get? Five minutes. Five minutes we'll say, is yeah? fine. Well, do you want to say come back at five thirty, or is that too long? I'll start at five thirty. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, welcome back, everybody. What a nice. You know, you can tell there are lots of ways to recognize a nice group, but when they all talk. When they're all eager to talk to and grab a minute to talk to each other. Some of them not even leaving their seats. They don't want to lose a second in talking. But some going out. That's that's good. That's a good sign. I think you've got a great program and a great group here. Just the things I've heard about it. I think I'll have to mention it in my blog next time. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm going to have to do that. You notice uh, you also noticed that I mentioned that a, a lot of this work was involved with with undergraduates, and we have a, a program at Williams College, around 30 undergraduates around every summer, working uh, on current research projects for nine weeks. There are going to be six groups this summer, including my geometry group, but all different areas of mathematics, and students come from all over the world to participate in this. In 2009, I did something a little different. I took my group to the World Center for studying the kinds of problems we were working on, which was Granada, Spain. And we were there for the whole time. I, you know, it was fun on the way to the university. We'd walk past this wonderful statue of Queen Isabella sending Columbus off to discover America. And that happened just outside Granada, where she was encamped in an attempt to recover this last Arab stronghold and reunite Spain. And she succeeded in 1492 the same year that Columbus discovered America, so it was a great year for Queen Isabella. It's also the, the site of that wonderful old Arab palace, the Alhambra, with all of its geometric designs and tilings. A lot of interest in those things, and we could see it from our residence in the old Arab quarter, which is where we were staying. There we're seated on the walls of the Alhambra, and you can see the old Arab quarter, the al scene in the background. And the, we would sit there in the garden. It gets so hot there in the summer, they don't have air conditioning, so there are lots of, lots of green and fountains, and you try to cool off. We would work there and did a lot of math there, and I saw a lot of them that summer. También and, co yes, and Alex summed up the whole thing this way. También descubrimos la combinación perfecta, problemas isoperimétricos, Granada y nosotros. Yeah, he was a good one to have along, by the way. He was from Puerto Rico. <laughs> and was our translator, but uh, we had a very good time that summer. And you know, there are lots of these sites all over the country. There's 70 maybe, when, where students go to do research over the summer. Great experience for students. We should send them all off. Maybe you've had been involved in programs like that, or sent, had students. Yes, what did you do? You two? I went to um, research experience for undergrads at Mount Holyoke College oh, in 1990. <laughs> Wasn't I there then? Um, I think I, I gave a talk there that summer. I don't remember. But I, I like, yeah, Mount Holyoke I was involved from the beginning. And yeah? And I was a graduate assistant with the program at Clemson University. Oh, at Clemson, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, those were both, those are well-known successful programs. And yes, Mary? I had a student who went to Notre Dame, and it was a mathematics and robotics. And these are good, the good experience. Oh, for she us. loved it. And for you, it. was it a good experience? But you look hesitant. You have some reservation about it. No. No, it was a completely good experience. Yeah, yeah, good. So send students off. They like doing things like that. It's good for them. And then they can go and speak at MathFest, maybe. I don't know how many of you are going to be at MathFest this summer. It seems to be growing every summer. Great meeting. It will be August 1st through 5th in Madison, Wisconsin. Say what? I said I didn't know MMA also did a summer thing. I remember I went to their uh, fall competition last November. Oh, you went to a competition in November and there was the annual yeah, meeting yeah, was in yeah, Boston? Yeah. Boston? No, I was talking about the one in Connecticut. I see. Um, are we thinking of two different things? No, it's uh, one is a sectional meeting. Uh, our sectional meeting is competition. Oh, that's what that was. Yeah, yeah. Where was that? Uh, Connecticut College, I think. 
Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, I knew about that. There were some nice presentations, and apparently uh, we're having that on Bridgewater State University's campus this year. Yeah, so these local meetings are different, and they're great, and it's easy to get to, right, and more convenient. And go to everyone and give a talk at every opportunity. That's what I tell my students. So we have to do it if we want them to do it, I guess. But, it, you know, it's fun. Go give a talk. So that'll be in Madison. So undergraduates can do these problems. We can do, anybody can do research maybe, I guess, I don't know. I, this, was a, this was the title slide from a talk I gave to high school students up at Hampshire, Hampshire College about some work that we were doing. And they were getting involved in some of this research. I told them about Hales' hexagonal honeycomb theorem. And then this variation that my students were working on that summer, which is, suppose now you change the problem, and instead of minimizing perimeter, you minimize perimeter plus some constant times the number of vertices. So you penalize using lots of vertices. So now that gives a certain disadvantage to using hexagons. So, so what do you think then might be winners? Yeah? I'm guessing the square grid. The square grid, yes. And the square grid. That's the why the contractor was uh, <laughs> preferred the square tiling, I'm thinking. Because he didn't like the corners. Yeah. But that doesn't affect the amount of ground. <laughs> no. <laughs> but, but, but maybe, uh, you know. And in fact, I would think the sharper corners on the tiles would be dangerous for him and his workers. <laughs> they could, you know. So certainly when we have no penalty on the vertices, we know the hexagons are best. Increase the penalty, squares are best. Anything else? Triangles. Increase the penalty, triangles are best. And maybe somewhere in between it might be good to mix in some pentagons. So they weren't able to settle that. So that was their starting question. And, but they did get a theorem out of it. So look at this theorem. It says that in different regions, what's best? So they said when A is small, right, when it's less than or equal to 0 0.09, then the hexagons are best. And then in the next region, the regular pentagon would be best, except they don't pack, so we don't know what's best. And then in the next region, the squares are best. And then in the next region, the triangles are best. So there they have a theorem, whole story about what the best tilings by polygons when you have this penalty in there, when you have this penalty in there. And where does that 0 0.09 come from? Do you think they know the exact value? Yes, here's the exact value. <laughs> it's 2 square root of 5, 4 root of 5 minus 2 root 5 minus 2 root 2, 4 root 3. That's about 0 0.09. That was the best. Okay, now we're going off the deep end. Now we're ready to think about 3D. Well, you already got me thinking about 3D a little, but what polyhedron of unit volume has the least total edge length? It's a very strange question, right? A polyhedron with the least total edge length. So any ideas there? So we have one. So I want to see a few hands before we start this. But you'll get us started. I can count on you. That's good. <laughs> count on you. I'm sorry. I forget your name already. Joshua. And we have another volunteer down here. Yeah, good. Okay, so what do you guys think? Okay, there we have three. So what are you guys thinking? Mary? I was going to say dodecahedron. Dodecahedron, because that's kind of round. Just because it's right? a cool word. It's a, it's a cool <laughs> thing. And I was going to guess tetrahedron. Tetrahedron, which doesn't have many edges doesn't have many edges. In fact, that, that regular tetrahedron, I think that was, the, that was the first one I would think of. Yeah. Uh, I was Joshua? Also gonna, I was also going to guess dodecahedron. 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 Actually, dodecahedron has too many edges. Yeah. Too many edges. Icosahedron like also. Sense. Too many edges. Lots of edges. But there is something better than the regular tetrahedron. 
Yes. yes, you got it, Joshua, the cube. Because the cube has total edge length, what is it? It's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, maybe? Yeah, I think it's 12. And the regular tetrahedron turns out to be 12.24, if they both have volume 1. So the cube is better than the regular tetrahedron. But the cube is not the best. Okay. Wait, what's the fifth platonic solid that we haven't mentioned yet? You haven't mentioned the octahedron. Yeah. But I wouldn't have told you if it was right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a platonic solid. Interesting. Any other guesses here? What it might be? I thought I found a good idea back in ancient Egypt. You now we've been we have all we've already visited ancient yeah the pyramid right I thought it might be good but you were right it's not it's twelve point eight one. The best one known it has nine edges. Tetrahedron has ten. The tetra, the regular tetrahedron three. has six. One, two, three. Three coming down to the top and the okay. triangle at the bottom. Yep, yep. The triangle at the yes. Who is this person? Yeah. Who is yeah. this person? That's exactly right. The triangular prism, <coughs> equilateral, eleven point nine zero. <laughs> what? That kind of neat, the triangular prism, best known. But this has not been proved. So this goes under the name of Melzack's conjecture that the equilateral triangular prism has the least total edge length for unit volume. It's been around for a long time. No one has any idea how to prove it. Who was Melzack? He was a geometer. Years, I know he years sounds, ago? A hundred years ago. Uh, I know he sounds like <coughs> someone from Star Trek. <laughs> right? Wasn't there a Mel sack or something? But, but no. Uh, and that's still open. I think that's a great problem, right? Easy to tell people about. I'm pretty sure that the conjecture is right. But hard to prove things like this. Very hard to prove things like this. Oh, yeah, question. Uh, what makes it harder to prove? Because of the three dimensional? No, actually, there are any, problem that, any problem where you want to find the absolute minimum oh. is very hard, right? Okay. Because you can check using the second derivative test that it's a local minimum. But how do you know that off in some dusty corner where no one ever looked before, there might, be a small, might not be a smaller minimum? Mm -hmm. So it's always very hard to prove that anything is the best solution. But generically, is it harder? 3D is much harder than 2D. Than the plane? Yes, 3D is much harder than 2D. Yeah, good observation. So on that note, here's another 3D question. Suppose now you want to do what Hales did in the plane with the hexagons, which is divide space into unit areas using the least amount of surface area or perimeter. Right? So you just want to divide up space into unit areas as cheaply as possible. What shapes would you use? Well, it's hard to think of any shapes that divide up space into unit, into unit volumes. Okay. Did someone mention the sphere fitting problem in, uh, er, in relation to the uh, ball, uh, sorry, in relation to the circle fitting problem on the plane? Already. Yes, sphere packing we talked about. Sphere packing we talked about in three space. That's right. Yeah, good judge. We talked about sphere packing. Of course, we can't use spheres for this because we're going to divide space into these regions and spheres don't fit together. You always leave space in between. We have to find space. We have to find shapes that fill up all of space. It seems like the easiest to think about is cubes. Yeah, cube. So that's a great idea. Well, of course, I think of my triangular prism. <laughs> right. Because I like that. 
But then I think cube is the natural thing to think about. And, you can, and that is better than the triangular prism. So that's very good. That's very good. But not best. Oh, here comes this triangular prism again. So. Um, did you consider a hexagonal prism? Hexagonal prism. Great idea. Oh, the dodecahedron, by the way, which you guys liked before. You can't tile with it. It would be great. Because it's almost spherical. It would be great, but it doesn't tile. The hexagonal prism beats the cube. Just because the hexagon beats the square. Yeah. So excellent, though not the best. <laughs> this one's hard to think of, actually. Of course, you could try a pyramid. That's terrible. Pyramid's terrible. But a really good one is to take your octahedron and truncate the corners, and you'll get this 14-faced thing, a truncated octahedron. So you know the octahedron? You, it's like a square pyramid on top and a square pyramid facing down underneath. And then you cut off all the little pointinesses, and there are six of them. So in addition to the eight faces you start with, you get these six little faces where you cut off the where you truncate, and that gives you 14 faces, and these things fit together beautifully. So there you can see, sort of see them fitting together. And this was the so-called Kelvin conjecture back in 1894. Kelvin guessed that this was the best way to divide space into unit volumes with these truncated octahedra. 1894. In fact, he thought that this is what space was. It was made up of of little octahedra in the ether. So that was his theorem. And that stood for a hundred years. He loved this thing. He would build, he'd give talks on it, he'd put, he'd put models up on stage to look at. See, here's the stage, the model. This is one of those stereoscopic things, so if you cross your eyes, you can see it in 3D. Can anybody do that looking at the screen there? You know, you cross your eyes so that the two images coincide, and then all of a sudden you can see it in 3D. It doesn't work for me because I'm nearsighted. Well, I don't know. I, I've done it. I don't have. I, 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 I shouldn't be able to. Do it. <laughs> Is this like those books? Does anybody? Can anybody get it? I never could do that. <laughs> well, yeah, I just did it. <laughs> Joshua just did it. So there it was for us. He loved this thing for a hundred years. For a hundred years, it stood, and no one could prove it for a hundred years. And then finally, just in 1994, two physicists found a counterexample, a better way of doing it, a more complicated way. They had to use two different shapes that fit together. One of them was a dodecahedron, but not the regular one, the fool's gold one. And the other one had 14 faces, but it wasn't, it wasn't the truncated octahedron. It was, it, was the, it was a more complicated 14 hedron. So this was a beautiful counterexample. It beat Kelvin by 0.3% in the last decimal place I showed you there. And they found it because it exists in nature. It's so-called clathrate compounds. That's how they, they had an unfair advantage over us. <laughs> Sometimes it's good to talk to physicists, I guess. So B. Kelvin by 0.03%. And you know, a lot of people recognize how beautiful this was. And it was the basis of the Beijing Olympics water cube, where Michael Phelps won all of his medals. That was just a cross section of the where feeling optimal space partitioning structure. What did you call it? Where, feeling? Where and feeling. Were they the two, were the physicists. They were the two physicists. I just saw where in Scotland at a soap bubble conference last month. And I reported it. It's, it's, uh, it's on my blog. You can read about soap bubbles in Scotland. And he's interviewed there, so you can meet him. If you go to the Huffington Post blog. Yeah. So where. And then it was his graduate student, feeling. Feeling was his graduate student. Okay, well, you guys are getting hot now. Now, what about <laughs> this question? 
So now what if instead of just minimizing the area, which was the problem we just looked at, you also add a penalty for vertices and edge lengths. Because these structures, like the truncated octahedron there, have lots of vertices and edges. By edge lengths, do you mean total edge length? Yeah. So now, there are going to be lots of winners, according to how big the penalties are. And some of them are going to be, well, maybe the tetrahedron, because it has so few edges and vertices. No, you can't pack space with tetrahedra. They don't fit. Did you know that? They don't fit together. But if you use, uh, they just don't tile. But you can use an irregular tetrahedron, and that's not bad. What else might you use? Cube, yes, definitely. Our, triangular, our beloved triangular prism, of course. The cube is a good one to use. Maybe a pyramid. I keep bringing in the pyramid. I know you don't <laughs> like the pyramid. Your hexagonal prism. What's your name? Bess. Bess. Hexagonal prism there. That's a good one. The pyramid. Does it have any hope of ever winning? Well, the students studied this, and it all depends on the penalties, right? How big a penalty you put on the vertices and the edge lengths. So here's what they did. So they, were, they looked at, we were trying to minimize the number of vertices plus some constant times the number of e times the edge length plus some constant times the number of faces, uh, times the area of the faces. And all those on the left were winners sometimes. Triangular prism, tetrahedron, cube, rhombic dodecahedron. But on the right are some that never win. The hexagonal prism never wins. And here's, a, here's the phase diagram, so the picture that summarizes everything that they discovered. So here is where, oh, this side is where the edge penalty is big. And there you see the tetrahedron doing well and the tr triangular prism doing well. And over here, where it's the area that's good, the area that has a big penalty, you want the area to be small, then you have things like the truncated octahedron. And what happens as you move down towards the origin? Well, then neither edge nor face matters. It's just number of vertices. And so down there, you can't beat the tetrahedron. OK, so now I'm going to tell you about the question I want to ask the students this summer. About what's the least perimeter n-hedral partition of space into unit volumes. So now we're fixing the number of faces. So if you want to have exactly three faces, that's impossible. There is no shape that has three faces. If you wanted to have four faces, then you have to use tetrahedron, some kind of irregular tetrahedron. And I'll have to find out which one is best. Actually, I think maybe mixing different irregular tetrahedron might do better. N equals 5, triangular prism. N equals 6. Yeah, it's certainly got to be the cube, right? I don't know if they'll be able to prove any of these, but maybe that one. I think they'll be at least be able to prove that for n equals 6, the cube is best. n equals 7. Yeah, it's hard to actually think of a good thing with n equals 7. Maybe n equals 8? Yeah, Ruth comes back with her hexagonal prism. I kind of like the hexagonal prism. I think that'll be better than the, than the octahedron. 
I always keep bringing in my pyramid, but it never wins anything. It never wins anything. N equals 7, it could be a pentagonal prism. Maybe that would be the winner. So this is what they'll be working on this summer. And you know, you guys and your students could work on... There's, there are an infinite number of problems like this, right? So, and if you get any ideas, email me before you publish. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you very much.